Hi, today we're going to talk about restriction enzymes and the polymerase chain reaction, or we abbreviate it PCR. And these are a couple of things that uh, need to happen to DNA before you can make a DNA fingerprint or a DNA profile. So um, this is kind of your basic beginning things that need to happen, and then we'll tie it all together to make a DNA profile or a DNA fingerprint. So a restriction enzyme is an enzyme that cuts DNA at very precise locations called recognition sites. So it's kind of like scissors for DNA, except that it cuts at very specific locations. So it's not just like a random cut. It would like be like giving a little kid a piece of paper with dotted lines and saying cut along the dotted lines and they can only cut in those locations. That's kind of what restriction enzymes do. They cut at precise locations called recognition sites. Okay, um, so do you see in your notes where it says recognition site? It's a sequence of four to eight bases. Um, so it might be like AATT or CCGG, and anytime it sees those four bases, it cuts the DNA. Uh, restriction enzymes were isolated and purified from bacteria, and they're named after the bacteria they come from, so they kind of have funky names sometimes. Um, but that's what bacteria does. It cuts your DNA, and then it kind of inserts itself into your DNA, and that's how it spreads. So they were able to isolate the enzymes that just cut the DNA, and then they were able to start using them to help make um, DNA profiling a little bit easier. So here's how they work. The HA3, um, the HAE3 restriction enzyme comes from um, Haemophilus adictus, and it cuts the DNA at the recognition site GGCC. So everywhere that there is a GGCC, this restriction enzyme would cut between the G and the C. Um, so remember, DNA is read from the three prime side to the five prime side. Um, so on the top, we read across this direction, and on the bottom, we read across the, we kind of read backwards. So if you want to take a look here, everywhere you see a GGCC, you want to cut. So you want to take a look, and our first one is right here, right? And it cuts between the C and the G. So it would cut right there. And then we would keep going. And there's another one right here, GGCC. So we would cut the DNA right there, right? Did we miss any? Because this one is so close, right? It's GGCG, but it's not CC, so we're not going to cut there. Um, and then same thing. We're going to read this direction on the bottom. So here's our um, GGCC right here, and we're going to cut, so it should be kind of in the same spot, and then our GGCC here, and then we're going to cut, okay? And so notice, now that we've cut the DNA, we have one, two, three separate fragments of DNA. This is a fragment, this is a fragment, and this is a fragment. So we have one, two, three fragments of DNA. And then what DNA profiling did was they figured out how to um, move the fragments from biggest to smallest. So like this is the biggest fragment, then this one, then this one, they would put them in order. Well, not everybody's DNA strands are made of exactly the same um, bases in the same order. So mine might not get the same size fragments as yours, and that's how they were able to compare them. Okay, so it started off with restriction enzymes that are able to cut the DNA. I put that example on your paper so that you can highlight where the restriction enzyme is, the recognition site, and where you can cut and labels to show that you have three separate fragments from this one. Um, here's another one. Okay, here's another one that we can do. Um, start with this one, I think. Okay, so this is the restriction enzyme we're going to use this time is ECORI, uh, which has a recognition site of GGAA, or sorry, GAATTC. And we're going to cut between the G and the A is where it cuts. The G and the A is where it actually cuts at. So the first thing that I want you to do on your paper is I want you to just find...
the recognition sites that there are for this strand that's down here. So let's see, if we go through here, here's one, right? G-A-A-T-T-C. Uh, this one, G-A-A-T-T-G. Okay, here's your next one. G-A-A-T-T-C. G-A-A-T-T-C, and there's one more right here, G-A-A-T-T-C. Okay, so there were one, two, three, four um, of the recognition sites. So now we're going to go through and we're going to cut in between the G and the A on each one. So this is where it would cut to make fragments. Okay, so now we have one, two three, four, five fragments, right? And then if we put them in order from biggest to smallest, fragment number three is the biggest fragment, right? So fragment three would be the largest fragment down here. And then it looks like fragment two would be the next biggest. And then fragment four, and then one, and then five, it looks like. So if we put them in order from biggest to smallest, that's the order that they would go in. So what they do is they cut them using restriction enzymes and then they put them um, in order according to their size. Okay. So the first kind of step that they figured out how to do is they were able to cut the DNA using restriction enzymes. Okay. And there's two types of DNA, uh, or sorry, two types of restriction enzymes. Sticky end restriction enzymes, which cut the DNA to uh, produce fragments that have what we call sticky ends or exposed nucleotides. The one we just did, the ECORI, is a restriction enzyme because on the top it cuts between the G and the A here, but on the bottom, you're reading backwards, it cuts between the G and the A down here. And when it cuts the fragments, it makes a sticky end or kind of exposed nucleotides. And then there's some restriction enzymes that cut the DNA at recognition sites and produce blunt ends, like the GGCC or the CCGG, where it cuts in the same place on the both top and bottom, and it makes a, just a blunt end. Um, and I will show you a quick example of that so you can see the difference between the two of them. So this is the ECORI1. Okay, and here's your DNA strand. This is the three prime to five prime on the top and then the five to three on the bottom. Okay, so there's your recognition site. The restricted enzyme binds to it and it cuts the DNA at the G and the A on the top and the G and the A on the bottom, but because they're not in exactly the same location, it creates these little sticky ends, which is just nucleotides that are exposed down here. Okay, so that's what a restriction enzyme looks like with a sticky end. All right. Okay. And then you're able to put them back together certain times if you would like to. Um, and then the blunt end just does the opposite. It just creates a very clean cut, and so there's no, there's no uh, nucleotides left over. All right. So those are the two types of restriction enzymes that you can have. So what happens if we only have a small amount of DNA to work with from our crime scene? This is the second kind of important concept we need to know before we jump into the whole process of DNA profiling. We need to know what restriction enzymes do, and then we need to know what happens if we only have a tiny amount to work with, and that's called the process of the polymerase chain reaction. So the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a reaction that allows for trace amounts, which is very small amounts of DNA, to be turned into large quantities of DNA extremely quickly, okay? The whole process takes about an hour to two hours. It's so fast, and it can make tens of thousands of DNA molecules, which is good because we need, sometimes we only have one or two little tiny strands of it, or a really small amount, one or two cells, and we need to make enough to actually test it, and we can do the PCR process. So here is the process. It's a very similar. They basically replicated DNA replication. Okay, so it's very similar. They just figured out how to do this in a test tube form. So step one, they heat the DNA 
sample to 98 degrees Celsius for five minutes to separate the DNA strands, okay? So they separate them out. Step two, they cool the sample to 60 degrees, so they cool it back down, and they add what's called a primer. A primer is a short strand of DNA that provides a start sequence. So in the picture over here, um, they added everything to the test tube and they split it apart, and then they added these. These are the primers, okay? And the primers are just a starting sequence where they can start the process of replication. Then, the free-floating nucleotides and DNA polymerase, which we talked about in replication, are added. Um, the DNA polymerase binds to the primers. So right here is the DNA polymerase, right? And it starts base pairing um, nucleotides, A's with C's, T's with G's, all the way through until it makes a new strand. So there's one on the top and one on the bottom. And you, after one cycle, you end up with two copies of the original DNA, okay? So everything gets put in the test tube together right? And basically they're going to heat it up, cool it down, heat it up a little bit more, uh, cool it down, and that process kind of um, signifies the next step happening. So let me show you an example of how this works. Okay, so look, we have this heated up to 94 to 96 degrees, which denatures the DNA. It's split it into a top strand and a bottom strand. Then we cooled it back down to between 50 and 65 degrees Celsius and added the primers. So here's one primer and here's the other. And it's just a set of bases that's complementary to the location that we want to be um, copied. And then we warmed it back up just a little bit, not enough to separate it, but just a little bit to 72 degrees. And we, the DNA polymerase goes through and it base pairs correctly the locations that we want. And now we have two identical copies of the DNA, okay? But now look, we're going to go to the second cycle, okay? Now we already have two strands of DNA that are identical. We're going to heat it back up again, which will separate out the strands. But now I have one, two, three, four strands that I'm working with. Then I'm going to cool it back down. I'm going to add my primers, okay? I'm going to warm it back up just a little bit. The DNA polymerase will go through. And now I have one, two, three, four copies of the original DNA that I wanted. Then I'm gonna to go to the third cycle and I'm gonna copy those four. I'm gonna heat it up, I'm gonna add my primers, cool it down, warm it back up again, DNA polymerase goes through. Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Do you see how this quickly multiplies the amount of DNA you have? Okay, you go to the fourth cycle. Now I've got, right, 16 copies of the DNA. I go to the fifth cycle, right? It's doubling every single time. So if you take a look here, after the first cycle, there's two copies of the DNA. After the second cycle, there's four. After the third cycle, there's eight. It's just an exponential growth. So if I keep clicking this, after 10 cycles, there's 1,024 copies of the original strand of DNA. Okay? After 20 cycles, right? Look at the numbers that we're at here, right? We're in the millions. Okay, and so very quickly you're getting exponential amounts of DNA, okay, after 30 cycles, this is the number that we're at, which is good because DNA is small and if we want to run a lot of tests on it for DNA profiling purposes, we need to have a good amount in which to work with. The DNA polymerase chain reaction is what allows us to do that. It gives us the ability, okay, to make a lot of copies of the DNA we're looking for quickly. All right, so step one, heat it up so that it separates it. Step two, cool it down and add the primers. Step three, your DNA polymerase goes in and base pairs the nucleotides. And then step four is that you have um, two copies of the original strands, okay? So it's very similar to DNA replication. It's just they figured out how to do this in basically a test tube instead of in your body. But it's a really, really important step in the process of DNA profiling.